There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with an enthusiastic review of the Norwegian novel Alberta and Freedom by Cora Sandell, originally published in 1931, translated about 30 years later, fabulously translated by Elizabeth Rokan. I wish Elizabeth Rokan wrote her own fiction because what a gorgeous translation. And I absolutely love this book. This is the second in a trilogy, so it's. I've heard other booktubers talk about the difficulty of reviewing a book in a series of books because you don't want to give any spoilers and whatnot. So, this is volume one, Alberta and Jacob, published in 1926, and I read this last year and absolutely loved it. I will put a link to my review, and it's about young Alberta growing up in the boonies of Norway in the far north with a very suffocatingly dysfunctional family, which produces in her a lot of shame and self-deprecating, self-effacing ways of hiding herself away. It's a beautiful story. It centers on Alberta's life when she's around 18 or 19, although she seems much younger in the story. Gorgeous novel. A year later, I read Alberta and Freedom, and this was a buddy read with the booktuber who is from Norway, Celia. I will put a link to her channel in the show notes. We had a very relaxed buddy read where we just kind of read at our own pace and checked in with each other, and I'm not even sure if Celia's finished this novel yet. I finished it about two weeks ago, maybe. This novel is about the protagonist, Alberta, and... As the novel opens, I believe she's maybe in her mid-20s. I'm not exactly sure. I don't pay attention to age very much because I myself never age. But she's in her 20s, I think, and she is in Paris. And the opening scene is her posing for an artist. Uh, she is in the nude in the artist's studio. And this is how she is scraping together enough money to live. She is a writer wannabe, and that is a theme that is woven beautifully through the novel. But at this early stage, she is just kind of working odd jobs, but she is free. She has left behind her hometown in the boonies of Norway, and she is exploring an independent life. I have to say that this is uh, not a very plotty novel. Things do happen, and some of the things that happen are dramatic, but mostly this is a rich character study. This is a character-driven novel, and the character is Alberta. Richly drawn, autobiographical in many ways. I have never identified so deeply with a character in literature in my entire life as I identify with Alberta. Her self-deprecating, self-effacing personality makes her kind of fade into the background, but we are located so deep in her consciousness and her struggle to push outside her comfort zone and make some kind of a life and not starve to death doing it in Paris and to resist the misogynistic, sexually harassing environment that was all around her as she made her way as a single woman through Paris in the, what would it have been, around the turn of the century maybe. The book was published in 1931, but I think the setting is quite a bit earlier, so early 20th century. And she isn't really interested in settling down with a man. She's not sure what she wants to do, but she has vague creative impulses. She is surrounded by a group of artists and has various kinds of friendships and relationships and mentorships with them. And all of that is fascinating, but what's deeply gripping, or was at least for me, is her personality. So that's really all I'm going to say. We find out in one sentence, and I'm not going to tell you what that sentence said, about halfway through the novel, something big, something calamitous that happened that made her leave Norway. And that piqued my curiosity, and that curiosity did get satisfied by the end of the novel. So we kind of feel that she's kind of repressing stuff or not dealing with some stuff from her past. And she's a hot mess. I loved her to death. 
it's like Catherine says in Wuthering Heights, Nelly, I am Heathcliff, and I want to say, Booktube, I am Alberta. I don't want actually don't want to be flippant about it. It, it, it was destabilizing how deeply I identified with her. Oh my God. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to close with some excerpts. Most of them are very short, and one is a little bit of a longish paragraph. None of them have spoilers, and a lot of them, uh, especially the big one at the end, show the kind of vaguely epiphanous realizations that kind of waft through her consciousness. And like me at that age, and like me still today, Alberta... You know, she gets herself into very dark or lost places, but there's always this little something in her consciousness that propels her to not give up and to try again and to give herself kind of a an affirmation. And that sounds so gross. Affirmation? Is this inner child novel? No, but it's the beautiful true part underneath all that that can be explored in a stunningly deep novel. I have one more announcement at the end, but let's listen to my quotes. One or two of these you may have seen on Instagram or on my Sunday sentence, but not the big one at the end. Hope, the untiring, again put out surface roots into nowhere, in spite of everything. Or she remembered how the air had tasted sometimes when one went out of doors. Mild air with a thaw in it, air in transition, just as the cold was about to set in. It lay sparkling on the tongue, fresh and mild as water. She would have to write again and borrow in the meantime, scrape material together as best she could, trim it and send it off. It had worked before, it ought to work now. Blue with cold, her fingers stiff, she set to, out of practice and reluctant, attempting to find the smallest thread that lay, thin and miserable, hidden somewhere in her mind. She ought to be able to tell the person from whom she was going to borrow that this was her article. Here it was in her hand. In a few days, the fee would arrive. And finally, one of my very most favorite passages, and this is the longer paragraph. Each time Alberta woke in her comfortless little room with the comfortless sounds of poor people's gray lives seeping in through the gap under the door, the shuffle of slippers in the morning rush, the tap perpetually running, the slamming doors, she received a stinging, rough reminder that there is a worn, hard little path across the Fogbond Marsh, where we can see no further than tomorrow. There is a ridge that one can grope for, hard to the feet, but safe. Toil, honest toil, no matter what. Perhaps something will get frostbitten on the way and shrivel up, but there is no need to lose one's foothold or one's way and one's weakness will not become open to anybody who happens to be in possession of the small skeleton keys to it. Tenderness in the voice, certain words that one craves to hear, that single one out from other people and run rippling through body and soul like a healing spring. Kindness in a difficult moment. So it is passages like that and the characterization of Alberta, my most favorite character and the person I identified the most in any of my literary reading in 53 years of life that make me declare to you all right now that Corisandel is my favorite writer. I recommend this to you highly, but I obviously think you should start with this and next year, probably for Women in Translation, I am looking forward to the final volume, volume three, Alberta Alone. Thanks for watching.